Good afternoon, welcome to today's video hangout. Now we're joined by the hosts of Weekend Sunrise, Andrew O'Keefe and Monique Wright. Howdy! Uh, both obviously quite familiar faces to, uh, to many of you, but I'll give them a quick introduction. Um, so Andrew's been a mainstay on Australia's highest rating weekend breakfast show since 2006. Uh, he's also known to viewers for his decade-long stint hosting the, new, uh, the quiz Deal or No Deal, uh, also on 7, um, as well as his uh, other stints and various uh, musical theatre and, uh, and other things, which we'll touch on a bit later. Uh, now, Monique joined Andrew on the sofa initially as an interim replacement for Sam Armitage uh, in August. She's officially given the job full-time last month. Uh, she's been summarised by the presenter and hosts the after network's afternoon chat show, The Daily Edition. Thank you both for joining us. Thanks, Great to be here. So we'll start with the easy one, which is, uh, you know, Malik, what took them six months to give you the role? <laughs> Andrew didn't know if he liked me. Oh, see, so, so, uh, yeah, it took a while. Um, the answer's a bit boring, really. I, I think that it just took, well, first up, things happen slowly in TV. Uh, but also, I had just come back from maternity leave and had taken on um, The Daily Edition, which is a new chat show, which is in the afternoons from two till three. So I was one of the co-hosts on that show. Um, and then... Uh, the, the position became available, then what do we do with The Daily Show when I just started that? So for a long period, um, I was doing the seven seven days a week, but we just didn't know how it was going to how it was going to work out. Yeah. So just in the, the course of time, it sort of unraveled and, you know. And you here are, we are. You unravel having worked seven unraveled. days a week. Yeah. And uh, then yeah. I was I in a ball. I picked up an entire rehab centre, actually. <laughs> yeah. <I> really <laughs> and you said, come back, we'll give you two days off a week. During the week. So now I have two days off during the week from the daily edition and uh, then the two days with Andy. Mm, so it's, it's a pretty brutal schedule, isn't it? For, you know, especially as a new mum again. It's, uh, it was yeah, demanding. It, it, more demanding uh, my work at Irene's Chicken Deli, I have to be honest, uh, growing up because mm. you're never quite sure, um, you know, are you getting the right amount of chicken salt? Uh, you know, how to cut the, the breast from the thigh, those kind of well, things. Well, out in the lab as well, working so, on new formulations of chicken salt. Yeah, that was yeah. that was a lot more that's, difficult that's the trying. That's stuff, yeah. And, Does beef salt go with chicken? Well, I think the clear answer to that is no. But, you know, it's something that I wanted to flesh out you know, <laughs> in my role. So it's busy, but it's terrific. Okay. That's, uh, that's, uh, and how do you find working with Monique compared to... Yeah, other hosts. <laughs> <laughs> other hosts do. <laughs> do we can we just leave it as how do I find working with the day? No, do I have to do the comparison? <laughs> no, I have worked with a few different hosts on Weekend Sunrise. Uh, when I first got to the job, uh, Lisa Wilkinson was my co-host. Carly Gillies then did a brief stint. Uh, of course, Sam was in the chair for a number of years, um, and and then uh, fortunately. Monique was available when we needed her. Um, I love working with Molly. Um, you know, lo like myself, she has a, a somewhat uh, absurd sense of humour, which she finds a little difficult to repress at times. Uh, and, I, and I certainly don't act as a chain or a handbrake on her in that regard. Um, but, but more than that, you know, she's one of those people who really does her work. Um, also, I think, like me, she takes a, a, a very uh, simple attitude to live television, which is that you, you over-prepare everything and then you wing it on the day. So you know, you, I always feel confident uh, next to Moni that, um, that we're going to be on top of the facts between the two of us. So, you know, I, I love her humour. I love the fact she does the work. Um, and I think something that I love and viewers love as well um, is her... You know, a real palpable sense of humanity. She's a very warm person. Um, you know, commercial television, particularly breakfast television, um, tends to operate in pretty strict dichotomies in order to fire up the debate. Uh, but Mon's not averse to uh, exploring the subtleties of an issue, which is something that I, I really enjoy. I mean, there's, there's sort of a lot made of, obviously, chemistry, which is very important when you're hosting what, three or four hours of TV live. Uh, together. I mean, how well did you two know each other before you sort of started presenting together and how much time do you spend together you know, off camera? Is it is it literally you see each other in the studio beforehand and head home straight after or do you actually you know hang out a bit? Well, we don't really hang out as such, do we? No, but I think, so, so it, it will generally go, we see each other before we go on air and then we come off air 
we definitely do a bit of a debrief, um, and then we both go our separate ways. But we would be communicating on email during the week with the rest yeah. of the team, and yeah. and fleshing out ideas and working out the you know approaches to things and what stories we're going to be doing. So we sort of communicate in that way. And in terms of before coming on and, and taking on the role. Um, I had filled in for Sam over a number of years, so had uh, worked with Andrew then. And uh, and he is a dream. He's the uh, best uh, person uh, I have ever sat next to. Oh, you're because he's, I've always been attracted to the naughtiest person in the class. Um, but not only is he that, he's also the smartest and the funniest uh, and the kindest, a, a, a great, um, mark of a person, I think, in TV is what the floor crew thinks of you and what the rest of the team thinks of you. And there is not one person who does not love Andrew. He knows everybody's name. He knows that the story behind, you know, that person. Um, well, that's it's, very kind. You know, I, I sacked most of the floor crew <laughs> that didn't get along with me before you came along. So, uh, so <laughs> with his cronies, <laughs> yeah, cronies, you yeah, know, uh, they, they, they really <laughs> love him. Uh, and um, he's so interesting to work with because his mind is like nobody else. There's only one Andrew O'Keefe and his mind, this is the feedback that I get all the time about Andrew, is, wow, how do you keep up with him? And it's great because you're awake the whole time. You know, you'd think on live TV that you would be mm. awake all the time anyway. Um, but not, not always. But with Andrew, you never know where his mind's going to go and well, where excellent. something can end up. So it's so interesting. And, and, and you know, really uh, the same on as well. Um, you, you know, outside of television, uh, before I even got into television, I did a lot of improvising. Uh, and, and, you know, the key to improvising is always to say yes to the idea that is currently on the table and just see where it will take you. Um, Mon, uh, you know, I don't know whether you, you, you did any theatrical improvising or not, but Mon is a natural improviser. She, she's happy to uh, accept whatever offer lands on her desk and just see where it takes us. If it's, if it's useful, fantastic. If it's simply funny, yeah, terrific. And, and she has a great sense of how far you, you can take an idea. Um, as, as far as hanging out together, I mean, we don't, we don't do a lot of that, but we're very similar personality. Yeah. And we're at a really similar stage of life. So I think, you know, without having been old pals, we, we really understand each other. Yeah. Well, he said. Got to get on. We got it. Uh, we'll throw it to Miranda now, who's in the newsroom, who's uh, monitoring social media for questions. So, Miranda, have you got something for us? I sure do. Damien has said that Andrew O'Keefe seems to really split the audience. He thinks that people either really love him or really hate him. And he wants to know, has he ever felt any pressure to step down or felt he was going to be pushed aside for more for someone more middle of the road? Did Damien mention whether he was in the love or hate camp at all? <laughs> no, not Unfortunately <laughs> not. <laughs> I, look, I think, uh, Damien, and, and thanks for that comment, it's something I'm very aware of, and, and certainly the people that, uh, that track the social media around Weekend Sunrise are, are also very aware of that. Um, but, you know, TV is a very diverse place these days. Um, you know, there's a, there's a niche for everyone and there's no way that you can appeal to every sensibility of, of every viewer. Um, the only way you can do that, of course, is not to say anything or not to believe anything. Uh, in a sense, not to be anything. Um, and, and then no one will have any cause to dislike you, but then neither will they have a cause to like you or to, uh, to be interested in what it is that you have to say. So I think, um, you know, the approach that I take, and, and I think the approach that Mon takes as well, is that we, we just say what we believe. We're, we're not always convinced that what we believe is, is the right thing, um, is the truth, with a capital T. Um, but we say what we believe, and if, if others don't believe that, well, you know, that's their prerogative. It's a, it'd be a very boring world if everyone believed the same thing, wouldn't it? And maybe I can just add to that. Damien, um, that even if you take a middle of the road view on, on everything and you sit on the fence, people will hate you for that as well. <laughs> so you can never ever get it right. And that's certainly one of the things that I love about Andrew the most is he's really brave and often says things that he knows that people are going to hate. 
And, you know, often his humour might, you know, might get up somebody's nose and that's okay too. And that's, you don't have to like everything about us um, and think that the people that end up being, you know, really successful are the people that polarise a bit. I, I think the television screen itself tends to be a bit of a magnifying glass. Mm. Um, it exaggerates everything about the people on TV. So if you have a natural inclination to like some, someone, um, the, the mildest or weakest of jokes will suddenly seem hilarious to you. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the, the smallest kindness will suddenly make you a saint. Uh, but conversely, if someone has a natural antipathy towards you, just a personality thing, um, the, the, the littlest mistakes or, uh, or the uh, slightest misjudgments of tone will suddenly seem criminal to those people. So, uh, you know, that's just something that you deal with on telly. I mean, is that um, something you've noticed more uh, as you've sort of gone through your careers that, you know, obviously as you get more famous and people recognise you more, that, and I guess with the changing media as well, where we now have you know, news.com and uh, Mail Online, both well known as two examples of, uh, of, you know, media outlets that really love to peddle the celebrity story and sort of blow up an on screen gaff or, you know, a slip of the tongue or whatever. Do you find that you're now more aware that what you say and what you do, you know, even in the off, you know, off screen world will now probably end up, well, could end up being sort of front page news for, for something like that? Uh -huh. I'm more aware, more of social media than anything else. It doesn't alter anything that I do. So if you end up on the front page for, you know, for, for doing the wrong thing, well, that's okay. I, I don't set out to do the wrong thing anyway. Um, so I'm more aware of it, but I, I wouldn't alter my behaviour mm. in any way. Mm. Oh, look, I had a really interesting lesson around this when I wound up on YouTube uh, uh, rather shickered one night in Melbourne and rolling around in a gutter. <laughs> but my mother referred to it as gutter journalism. <laughs> anyway, um, and, and what, what I discovered out of that was that the, the censoriousness of the media was far greater than that of the public itself. You know, the, the public were far more forgiving, far more understanding of... Um, you know, the flaws of, of any human being than the media were. And, and, and of course, it's the media job to beat these things up, or, sorry, parts of the media see it as their job to beat these things up, or to beat up on people like ourselves, um, to, to create headlines, to create controversy that, you know, click fodder, basically. Um, but I think the public is generally smart enough and forgiving enough uh, to know what's important and what's not about a person. And so it's, it, it, you, I guess with social media, as Bodie mentioned that there, you know, a lot's picked up there. I mean, um, Andrew checked out your Twitter account earlier. I think you tweeted twice. <laughs> I, I, I don't tweet at all. Yeah. That, that's not me. That's not me. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, no. I'm aware that there is an Android keep who um, uh, uh, uses a photo of me or is my doppelganger, I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> tweeting out there. Twin, yeah. <laughs> I've got someone, because I'm not on Twitter yeah. either, and uh, there's, there is someone, I don't think that there's a photo of me, but certainly she has you know, a whole heap of interesting people following, <laughs> following her, uh, apparently. Uh, yeah, and writes back. And how do you deal with that? You know, it's uh, I guess at the end of the day, someone actually taking control of your brand and your, you know, you know so much gets blown up and beaten up from social media, especially on a lot of media outlets these days. How do you deal with that? Well, I mean, I think ultimately the way that I, that we will probably have to deal with it is take control by actually starting Getting to take it ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> I think both of us. That you, I mean, I hope I'm not putting words in your mouth, no. anyway, but both of us have had a very similar attitude. Uh, towards uh, Twitter and social media in general, in that we both think there are so many fascinating people out there who have uh, a lot of time to send highly amusing, um, sometimes very well considered uh, tweets, you know, uh, missives into this world of ideas that you know, what we can add is probably something pretty slender. Yeah. Um, 
and, and short of that, we probably don't have the time because we're picking up kids from school and, and taking out bins and stuff. Um, and I think that we would, being generally interested people in things, I think I'd become obsessed by it. Everybody else, not the things I could possibly send out, but just reading everybody else's, and I can't imagine where I would ever fit that in. But I think in time, we will both, as Andrew said, have to go that step, but we've sort of not done it yet. Mm. I'd imagine you both garner quite a lot of fans quite quickly. This is very sweet of you. <laughs> I'm sure you have an awful lot to input as well. That's the quality of some of the debates. Um, Sort of move off um, that for a moment. Um, we're going to go to Wake Up, um, and obviously you're both you now experts in the breakfast TV world uh, over many years. What do you make of that, and where do you think it's gone wrong? What has it gone wrong? Is it just unlucky? Um, I haven't watched it extensively, but I do know several people that that work on it, and I. Um, admire them enormously and I think that there is a lot of talent there. I think it's a really hard market to break into. Breakfast TV, people just are used to who they wake up with. It's a it's a very sort of personal time of the day because people are getting ready, they're they're doing things. So you're you're in their lounge room. It's not it's it's not necessarily a program where you are you're sitting down and watching. People are doing other things. So you're actually part of a household when that's going on. And I think people are a bit set in their ways. You know, and yeah, I, I don't think that I can't see what they're doing wrong. There's terrific people that that work on that program, and maybe in time things will change. And I think there's plenty of room for everybody. I, I also think that whilst the the public are very forgiving of um, individuals on television, they can be terribly unforgiving of productions. Um, and uh, I, I don't know, I can't give you the exact reasons why, uh, but it appeared to me in that first week of Wake Up, it had a, a tone of unpreparedness about it. It was still two weeks away from being ready. You know, they were trialling things on air. And simple things like camera angles or um, links between various uh, parts of the set or between set and, um, and reporter, that kind of thing. Um, and in that first week, there was a lot of clunkiness. That, that, I mean, I don't think that can be denied. There was, I mean, there was a much debated issue with the chemistry between the hosts, but I, I, I think that you know would have sorted itself out in time. Um, but those production value things, most people can't name what they are, but they know when they're seeing something that makes them uh, feel uh, stilted or uncomfortable, or that they're just not quite getting. And in that first week, there was a lot of that. You, I just don't think you can, it's very easy to come back from a launch like that. So people then might have tuned in in that week to just have a look, weren't quite sure but didn't feel comfortable, is that we're saying, and then went back to what they knew and, and then perhaps yeah. were reluctant to try again. Yeah, yeah they, they, they don't have a compelling reason to try again. Mm -hmm. um, they may come to um, you know, the show will obviously get some runs on board, it'll break a few big stories maybe, um, it, it, it'll really bed down what it wants to look and feel like, and gradually people will start to taste it again, but I think that's a bit of a long road. That's an uh, interesting answer, I think. Uh, I'm sure there'll be a lot of people taking notes. Um, we'll go back to Miranda now out in the newsroom. Miranda, have you got another question there for us? I do. Uh, people are interested in how you both keep up with the news and how you make sure you stay relevant to your audience. <laughs> Keeping up with the news, I think if you, again, if you're a generally interested person, then you've got the radio on in the car all the time and rather than listen to music most of the time, you know, I'm listening to uh, you know, issues-based radio, um, constantly reading at home. I think I always just feel like I have never done quite enough. There's just so much more that I could be doing and, and learning about. In terms of keeping relevant, I'm not exactly sure um, in what context, but I think making sure that you have a context so you have an underlying amount of knowledge and being interested in everything, like not just putting 
one section to one corner, you know, to a corner. I'll often read things that don't spark my interest initially, but it all builds up a level of context so that you can, um, you know, you, you're gonna you're gonna just feel confident in knowing that you've got a, a broad base mm -hmm. of knowledge, and I think that that perhaps gives you a, a relevance. I think, I think we. I, I totally agree. Totally agree. And, and and on another note, around the same thing, I think when you work in news and you love news like like we both do, um, it's it's really easy to become obsessive about the news sources, to spend you all day, you know, clicking through websites, reading every article in every paper, you know, retiring at night with the New York Times or the Washington Post, you know, just being totally submerged in news. But I, I read once upon a time, I, I'm pretty sure it was Mark Twain, who said that um, uh, trying to work out what's happening in your world by reading the newspaper is like trying to tell the time by looking at the second hand. You know, the way you remain relevant, I think, um, is to constantly renew your own beliefs about the way your world works. And that doesn't come strictly from the news. As Moni says, that comes from a much wider read, a much broader experience of, of, of life, essentially, of, of remaining interested in the things that are happening around you, be they public things or, or just the, you know, the, uh, the interstices of your own family life. And, and in fact, a lot of where you get relevance and context from is just talking to people. And then you get a sense of, and if you are interested in people, then you get a general sense how people feel about issues, what they're talking about at that time. Um, yeah, so probably um, that would be the most powerful information source is always having your eyes and, and ears open and being interested. Um, and do you spend much time with the ratings? You know, did you have you know, seen some presenters quoted as saying they pour over the ratings charts every morning and you know want to see what 15 minutes has gone best and what's gone worst and where the demographics are shifting I mean is that something you guys spend a lot of time doing or is that something you leave for the production team and other people to worry about well I know I look I look at the ratings every day but I don't break down the ratings into different demos um, you know uh, for me a, a 60 year old non-grocery buyer is <laughs> <laughs> has just as much human value as a 35-year-old <laughs> Huggies purchaser. Uh, so, you know, I look at the overall figure, uh, but, but I don't uh, obsess about breaking that down. Um, you, you know, kind of further in this regard to the last question, you look at the ratings overall, not just to see where you are, but to see what is interesting mm. people, um, so that you know what it is that you should be taking an interest in if you want to be having a conversation with people. Uh, I'm exactly the same. Always look at them, uh, and it's always nice if you're rating well. Mm -hmm. But I don't look at the breakdowns. But I, I would ask the people that do and say, oh, if you know, if you haven't rated as well, I might say, oh, what, what didn't they like? What do we have at the top of the hour again? Mm -hmm. And you sort of go back and have a have a look in that way. So you're aware, you know, you have to be aware of them. Everybody's aware of them. Uh, you're much more aware of them if you lose a day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, that's only happened about three times. Yeah. In my day. <laughs> Just saying. Just saying. <laughs> yeah, it's not what I'm saying, but yes. <laughs> um, so, Dan, did you sort of uh, to come to this very much direction that you know, deal or no deal, what's going on with that? Well, we, we stopped filming um, uh, new episodes of Deal or No Deal at the end of last year. Uh, we had at that point filmed over the course of 10 years 2,200 episodes. <laughs> so that's What's that? It's like 57 and a half thousand briefcases we'd open, and we'd be excited about every <laughs> one of them. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, we, we, we decided at the end of last year that it was, um, you know, for all of us, unnecessary to film anymore. They're currently rolling out repeats. Um, no one until right now. Has noticed. Are <laughs> <laughs> oh, you Maria at the fruit market? Maria at the notice. fruit market yeah. is outraged. <laughs> Absolutely outraged. Yeah. 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 So it, it, it's completely gone, is it? Is it not going to be coming back at least for the foreseeable? Well, in in the short term future, yeah, that's the case. Um, you know, we're, we're doing everything we can to bolster uh, the lead into Million Dollar Minute, which of course is now the 
linchpin into the news. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think when you've got a job like that on your hands, you really have to focus your energy on that. So we're not even thinking about deal at the moment. Um, you know, million dollar minutes picking up a nice audience. So we'll see how it goes. Yeah. So do you think we might see something new to replace deal? I mean, was it just the format after 2004, 2003 you started? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, the format after that period of time just sort of simply couldn't keep refreshing. Is that well, I mean, we 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 were very good at at, um, at reinvigorating the deal at the beginning of every year. We'd always have some new handle, some new look, some game mechanism, whatever. Uh, and and I think that served us very well. We we, we never just coasted with the deal. Um, but you know, the simple fact of the matter is that it's a guessing game, and we had people uh, playing the same guessing game for ten years. And after a while, um, you know, everyone understands that that it is simply that. Um, and with any form of television, I mean, ten years is a long, a long time. Ball. Um, you know, we still enjoyed it. We had a ball. The audiences that came along had a ball. Um, it's tough to ask a wide audience to keep watching something in which they know what they're going to get, mm -hmm. essentially, uh, for 10 years. Um, having said that, you know, I, I am extremely proud of everything that happened on Deal. Uh, it was the first show at 5.30 in Australia to average a million viewers across a whole week. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in, in the heyday of Deal, which was about 2007, 2008, you know, we were standardly getting 900,000, 1 million viewers. Um, by the end of last year, that was down to 550 to 650, something like that. Um, you know, which is still fairly reasonable, but I think from a network point of view, it, it's not just about that one show, it's about the whole network identity. Um, and, you know, if, if you want to stay fresh in people's eyes, we have to look at every part of the schedule, and I guess deal with the least fresh of all of them. And so, million dollar minute. Do you think do you see that sort of taking the place of deal in terms of replacing that sort of audience, replacing the? Well, I hope so. One? I hope so. I mean, Simon is. <clears throat> a, I think a terrific host. Um, he has a a real old school charm about him, and he knows exactly what he's doing. The format is very straightforward. Now, I don't say that in any um, in, in a pejorative sense in any way. You know, some of the best formats are extremely uh, straightforward. Uh, whether or not uh, that in itself is enough to entice um, particularly the younger demos, I don't know. Uh, but it's building, you know, um, and now that uh, hot seat is the, you know, the long-term incumbent in the zone, then that may start to suffer some of the fatigue that they deal did towards the end as well. So who knows, who knows. So it's a tool up for grabs, I guess, at the indeed, moment. Indeed, indeed. Uh, I guess, you know, when going back to breakfast here, you know, obviously talk about you know, sort of weekend breakfast and weekday breakfast. How, how much difference is there between doing the two shows? You've both done both of them. I mean, other than obviously having to get up five days a week at stupid o'clock rather than ten. <laughs> <That's> stupid. <laughs> I think people have got a little bit more time on the weekend. So we definitely, it's it's not as much as of a tight, tight program. So there's much more time for us to flesh out issues, the interviews run longer, we definitely chat amongst the, you know, amongst the the, the set segments a lot more. Uh, it's just a bit more free flowing. So it's a, it's more relaxed. People are at home are more relaxed. So in turn we are too. It's a show that sort of reflects that. So there is more time. We probably also do um, a bit of a wrap up of the week and so try and take a different angle on things, so whatever has made news over the over the week, we would then look at that and try and find a, an interesting take on it. And it's something about the, the Weekend Sunrise production crew who I think are fantastic. Mm -hmm. And so they are, rather than just running with the news cycle, um, they are trawling through some of the most obscure sites and speaking to people in all areas uh, of the world. And they're a really interesting and diverse group and finding things that I haven't seen any, you know, I haven't seen anywhere and, and just really interesting people and interesting topics. So there's perhaps not as much time to do that during the week mm. and, and perhaps a little less pressure on the weekend that every single segment needs to 
be the news of the day or be you know be incredibly punchy. It can it can be a, it can be different to that. You can you know look outside the square a little bit mm. more and do a little bit more ob obscure as well as you know we obviously have the news hits you know on on the half hour, but perhaps some you know different takes on. Topics. It's interesting that how it's evolved over the years. I think we can sometimes. It, it was originally just the the night watchman, you know, to ensure that people didn't change the channel over the weekend in that time slot. But over the course of the last uh, eight ten years, um, it really has evolved its own distinct personality, and it's all of those things that Moni mentioned. It's a lot more relaxed. Um, we have a lot more latitude uh, to investigate rather than simply report what, what has been happening during the week. Um, we don't have quite as many of the commercial imperatives of sponsors and things that the weekday show has. Um, so, yeah, th there's just more time to, for the stories to breathe and, and therefore for us to, um, to play around with those stories. You know, either with humour or, or seriously, doesn't matter. Um, but you know, I, I think that we're extremely proud of, of mm. the identity that it has created for itself. I mean, we we uh, again back to the ratings thing. We we standardly rate as well as the as the weekday shows, um, and that's without you know giving away money or without uh, you know big name acts coming on the show to perform. Um, and I. I suspect it's got a lot to do with the, the nature of the audience on the weekend. Instead of having 10 minutes to watch telly before they rush out the door which, to a job that they're already thinking about as they're watching, they may have 20 minutes you know, while their kids are sucking on weed picks and whinging about going to cricket. And, and, <laughs> and to be fair, sometimes we do get the big acts. So yesterday on the program, we had an Irish dance crew that, yeah, <laughs> that, yeah. that closed the show. That, so yeah, sometimes we have, um, mm. you know. You do get the international acts. We, yeah. We, 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 yeah, we do. Yeah. And, and Bono often, was dressed as Bono. That's true. Yeah, it's a big act. Yeah, it wasn't Bono, but, you know, it was someone <laughs> dressed as him with a similar wig. Which is so, <laughs> yeah. And sometimes Andrew O'Keefe and Simon Reeve sing. So again, mm. the big acts. Yeah. Do you ever try to lure the cash cow over? That's not. <laughs> 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 sometimes I've been tempted to get into the cash cow market. Yeah. 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 During our superfood segment a couple of weeks ago, I thought we could have used the cash cow. Yeah. 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 So, so it's blue, tempting. Blue, blueberry fed wagyu cash cow. <laughs> because he is over there in the corner. We can see him while we're on it because we use the same studio. Yeah, we're big and snowy. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's it gets bad on the weekend. No one's cleaning up after him. <laughs> and yeah, I'm going to sort of wrap up on this question. You know, approximate ambition, would you like to do the, you know, to move up like time's done and sort of do the weekday show? You know, is there a bit of a rivalry with a crossy there? Ah, 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 well, there's certainly, there's certainly no rivalry. <laughs> um, I think we're very different personalities, but <laughs> whether or not a weekday show would actually want either of us is a, is a, is a question of to <laughs> yeah. itself. Um, I, I think you'd really, that's one of those gigs you'd have to consider long and hard. It really does change the very nature of your life, working five days a week in that time slot. I mean, Sam's out of bed at 3 a.m. Yeah. every day. That's not even the daytime. No, that's night. That's the middle of the night. But I did it for almost ten years working on Sunrise. Well, yeah, and of yeah, and it it, it really you do walk around like a zombie mm -hmm. uh, for a lot of the a lot of the time. Did you ever eat anyone's brain? I once had a cash cow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm a vegetarian, so that was a big deal for me. Uh, so no, uh, uh, no ambitions for that. Uh, all um, and and having worked on it, you know, love it, love the brand. I was actually part of the the very first Sunrise show in its you know current form, um, and five days a week has an enormous toll. Yeah, so the weekends are are, are quite enough. Well, if Sam, however, uh, and God forbid, fell down a manhole tomorrow and they mm. said more, he got the gig. Who was down there with her? Uh, <laughs> Head down there I with her. Down. I might head down with <laughs> her. Uh, I don't see that happening um, yeah. Yeah, at, at all. But no, it's, it's, it's not an ambition yeah, at all. Been there, done that. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I've never been the, the host of that no. uh, the host no. of that show. Um, but I've honestly never even thought about it until you, you know, brought it up. And Sammy's 
you know, doing such a such a great job. She's you know, a good mate, and she's yeah, she's just she's kicking. She's going you know fantastically. So I don't think unless maybe I should open a manhole in front of her. Well, you should. Yeah. Put yeah. yeah and I'll sure. see. I'll see. see. Yeah. You know, but then. <laughs> Um, yeah, my greater ambition is to do the Graham Norton show, mm -hmm. um, but sadly there's already a show called the Graham Norton show, <laughs> so Would you I won't let you do it. Yeah. Change your name for that one as well. I'm prepared to change my name, my sexuality, and my nationality <laughs> to host the Graham Norton show. Plastic surgery. Um. <laughs> sadly, he hasn't fallen down a manhole either. Mm -hmm. uh, on that bombshell, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll draw a line under this one. Um, but thank you very much for joining us today, Andrew. Thanks, Alex. Great to be here.